What's up guys, and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, well then, hello. My name is Erica and it is an absolute pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel. Because for today's video, as you can see from the title, I am joined by my lovely guest to review this book sitting directly behind me titled Sparrow. Now this is a newly released novel and we will let my guest tell you guys all about that but it's up to me to introduce exactly who that is. Today I am joined by the lovely Macy who runs the Instagram account Reading With The Gods where she reviews and discusses all the books that she's currently reading. Now, of course, this is very important to include that Macy is getting her master's degree, has an undergraduate degree in classics and so we are in incredibly good hands when it comes to reviewing and discussing all of the technicalities used in this book. If you guys want to go and follow her on her socials, it goes without saying that all of those will be in the description below, along with links to Sparrow, if at any point in the video you guys are interested to buy and to read it yourself. I do just want to say, actually before we get into it, there should be some trigger warnings on this book, so I will be including those trigger warnings in the description below because I do not want you guys going into this book blind and just buying it because we're obviously discussing it today but I'm sure we will get into all of those details as we chat. So Macy, do you want to start us off by telling us where the story goes, how the story unfolds throughout Sparrow? Yeah, so the book follows this young boy who has many different names. Um, so I'm not quite sure what to call him, but he's a young boy who was sold into like slavery as a child. And he grows up uh, work like working around these prostitutes um, in ancient Rome. I think it's fourth century Spain. Um, and yeah, it's just about his journey, uh, his interactions with the like wolves of this pub called Helicom and just all of the all of the stuff that's going on in the ancient world at this time. Okay, first question has to be, because I don't think that everybody knows, but when I invite people on to read books, I always give you guys a list. I'm like, pick whatever's on there. We'll order it, we'll read it. So I sent you a long list of books. I was like, Macy, which book? And you picked this one. What in the world drew you to this book in particular? See, I'm not sure because I read through like loads of different like blurbs and things like that. And it wasn't necessarily like the cover or the topic because I'm not super into Roman stuff. It's very interesting, but there were loads of things that I thought would catch my eye more. But I think because I enjoyed reading um, the Wolf Den books so much and I thought that this would be like a similar kind of vibe, I thought... I have a lot of love for like retellings of like Greek and Roman myth and things like that. But I feel like some of my favorite like ancient retellings are the like new characters that they've placed in the ancient world. So I think that was what drew me to it because I wanted to see this new character in an ancient world rather than just another Persephone retelling. <laughs> so then stepping back before we get into the nitty gritty, what did you think is like a general, I want to say like general reaction, general review, just sort of like very summed up like your feelings about the book? I think I had a lot of very mixed feelings. And I think one of the main things that I did want to like see before I read the book was some trigger warnings because it really took me by surprise in the middle of the book. And I had to sort of shut it and be like, oh, okay. I wasn't quite expecting that. Um, but generally speaking, I did really enjoy it. I really enjoyed how you're seeing this boy's first look at the ancient world. So it sort of mirrors your first look at this ancient world that you're reading about. So I thought that the way it was written, the description, I thought was really powerful, really enjoyed that. Um, but I just think there were some bits of the plot that I was like, I don't know how I feel. I couldn't agree with that more. Like, <laughs> The book was so well written, like you said, like the descriptions, even just like the sentence structure. I was like, this is beautiful. Like, yeah, well, this is objectively beautiful. But those scenes in the middle, I was like, what are we doing? And why do we have to be describing it in such depth? Yeah, because I feel like a similar point could have come across without like 
I don't know. I think it definitely has a place, but it was just so like heart, like re like it was so upsetting to read, and there was no warning. Like it, uh, yeah, it was difficult to read. Well, I think also because, like you said, like, the Wolf Den was so good, and I feel like with the Wolf Den, we still get into traumas that the women are facing in the Wolf Den, but it's nowhere near as in depth as this. No, I was like, there's certainly a way. Because, like, the way that this character does it is by, just in case you guys are watching who don't know, um, that, like, he kind of has, like, an out-of-body experience where he goes into this character of a sparrow and he, like, watches from above what's going on. But in those scenes, he's there. So we're yeah. there with him. And I was like, I, I wish that these scenes had been done from the sparrow's perspective of, like, yeah. flying over this horrendously traumatizing experience for this young child. No, I see. I completely agree with that because I think when those scenes were there, I thought it was very powerful because you see the trauma, but you're detached from it in the same way that he is. Whereas I feel like, especially with that device, it could have been used again and again, rather than like having this very traumatic moment. Absolutely. And there were two, like back to back as well, which I was like, yeah. Eek, we could have just, I mean, I didn't even want the first one. The first one was way too much for me. Like yeah. all the details of like this, cause he's like 10 as well. Yeah. This kid's a baby. So I was like, this is totally different from reading at least adults. Like it's still horrible when it's adults, but it's like, okay, at least they're like in their twenties or in their thirties or whatever it is. Like they've lived life up until this point. This is like a kid's first experience. This is a child that's having to go through this. And I was like, I don't care if this is actually what happened in the ancient one. I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. I know. Uh, and I think what I found really difficult as well is that they don't necessarily mention his age until I think after that. So I read all of this was like, we don't quite know how old he is, but like very rough stuff. And then you suddenly find like the number of like 10 or 13 or something is placed down. And I was like, oh, like it just immediately drew me back to all of that. And it, oh, 100% like that through that scene I was and I think this is probably just like I don't know maybe you felt the same way but it's like as the reader is somebody obviously who's older you're like okay they've got to be at least at least like 15 at this point yeah I was like that's the youngest I'm mentally allowing myself to allow this character to be and yeah. then like you said later on when that character says 10 I was like like recently 10 or did that happen when the kid was nine yeah or I was like what's the timeline jump here like was that I was personally very irked by all of that yeah no I agree I felt very uncomfortable and then I wasn't quite sure like I don't know how I would have done it but I just felt like there definitely should have been some sort of warning at the beginning I'm surprised that there wasn't any especially online because I had a look at a few like reviews when I was trying to pick a book and none of them had any like information of the like graphic content which I thought was quite interesting that's really interesting. That makes me wonder, like, did they read it the whole way through or were they paid to leave that review? If no one's mentioning it, because like that's the first, it's the first thing we're talking about. Like it's the yeah. biggest thing in the book, <laughs> which is like, should this be in here? How should you tackle such scenes? And if they're not mentioning, oh my God, I'm going to look this up right after this because I want to see these. Because there were a few things that are like, oh, like he's obviously going through stuff. He's in this like wolf den essentially, but nothing like referred to the very explicit content and I was just like that is very surprising yeah I feel like there's I feel like at the start of this book because okay the author's chosen to put it in and it's been published by Picador so like a big publishers like they've all yeah. seen it they've all decided yeah this is needed for the story even though personally I'm like could have left it out could have done something else yeah but it's then up to them if they've decided that that's part of it because I didn't know it was coming I assumed yeah. that he was going to go upstairs and then we'd see him crying like two days later or something. Yeah, no, exactly. And I feel like that would have been just as powerful. I feel like that shock factor didn't necessarily need to be there. And the fact that, again, that nothing has referenced this. I'm like, why are they looking for this shock factor? Because it's very unpleasant. Absolutely. Especially like, so those two scenes I found really like jolting. And then you also have the one with the young boy. What was his name? What is that other character's name? What when the there's the private party, yeah, and then there's yeah. the young oh, boy that also like chokes him, but like not, yeah, not in like a consenting kind of way. Before anybody watching is like, ooh, okay, no, like literally yeah. threatens his life, kind of a thing, which is horrible as well. That you're like, oh my god, yeah, like the whole thing, oh yeah, 
Well, okay. Well, what did you think about the pacing of this book though? Um, I thought the pacing was actually done very well. I think definitely like the first half, I was like making a few notes whilst I was reading it. And I did really enjoy how he was sort of growing up and you were making your way through the book in like sort of slow chunks. So it was like, okay, he's in the kitchen, your experience of him seeing the kitchen. And then he ends up going outside and then it's his experience of that. And then he goes further. And I think the pacing of that was done really well because each step he took was very different even though they were very similar like sights and sounds it was very different so I felt like it was making constant progress um so definitely for the first half I thought it was very well paced for the second half I think after the middle bit I felt sort of thrown off by it and then towards the end I was just like okay like I don't really know what's going on anymore but see for me I I think the thing that threw me off, I agree with the pacing. Like I liked how, you know, you're walking through his life. So like you said, you're experiencing the town and and just what this world had to offer at the same pace as him. But with there being no chapters, I was like, when do I put this book down to go and get like a glass of water? Or uh, like, yeah. so for me, I found it quite jolting. because I was like, I don't know if I put it down here if I'm halfway through something that we're then gonna get back into and then I'm gonna forget about or I'm gonna lose momentum. And so that's, for me, I know that that doesn't bother everybody. Yeah, I think, like, my reading style is that I will just read in long stints for, like, four or five hours. So I feel like the chapters weren't really an issue for me because I was just happy to just read. Um, But I, I get that. It's one of those things where I'm like, does it have chapters? Or, like, how like how much am I reading until it, like, breaks off? So, I, yeah, I get that. And also I found that a lot of... A lot of the scenes, I think, I agree with you, like after the halfway point, and maybe it's because I was also affected by the middle of it. I don't know, because I didn't clock that until you said it. But I found a lot of those scenes were just too long for me. Like, yeah, without ruining it, <laughs> one character dies. And there is a very long, like, after this character dies and they like have the mourning situation and they go and they have to bury the body and then they hang out around the body and they've got to pay the people who, and I'm like, okay, I don't need all this. Yeah, no, I agree. I felt like it really did just sort of go on and a lot of it felt quite repeated, which I understand because they were all having these like stresses about the death. But I just feel like it did feel quite repetitive and just like never ending. Even like after he was buried everything, I was just like, is he going to be brought up again? Like we're going back to it. Like that's like such like a, like an evil villain trope. That it's just like, he's never gone. Like <laughs> yeah. No, and literally. also the surrounding characters like what did you think about them as like a supporting cast so like the baker and the guy that washes all the cloths I can't pronounce any of their names Renatus and Nazarius I think is how you say the other guy's name Whatever. I think that, that's how I was reading it <laughs> <laughs> um I actually again like I did really like them I thought they portrayed like their spheres very well and they all had like very different characteristics that fit like their world and different types of people so again the boy he's meeting this one person who does this acts this way and then like enters like another sphere and I think I did really enjoy the the collection of people around him but I think I wouldn't necessarily have thought of those other characters because I was so focused on the boy but now that you've mentioned it I'm like oh they came together so nicely that it didn't feel like they were like intruding characters or that they didn't have a place. It's just, they were so well interconnected with the story that I think they were very well placed. I agree. And I think that as well, as the boy grew up, my opinions of those characters changed along with him, which I thought was done really well. So you know how like when he yeah. first meets the baker, it's like this big scary man and he's like walking through this thing and he's like, oh my God. And then he like takes more money off of him than he should have. And like, he's learning all of this, but when it gets to the end, of the book like that guy ends up being such a big help without yeah. ruining it for you guys he ends up helping and then yeah. even the guy that washes all the cloths after that middle scene was like the guy that ended up really helping this poor oh my god what are we gonna call him antonis mouse little one whatever sparrow, his sparrow like, yeah. Jacob. like there are so many names but like he ended up being such a cute like father figure in that scene that even like despite everything else that had happened I was like he's a gem 
Yeah, no, and I think that's the thing. Like, I think all of the relationships with the characters were done so well that as the boy changes his mind or goes through these experiences, you see a whole different light to all of these characters. Like, especially well, like with the baker, you see him in so many different scenarios and his sister and like so many independent things are happening that completely change your opinion. So I felt like they were very, like they weren't 2D characters. They felt like very real people. So. Have you read anything else by this guy? What else is he? I don't think so. Apparently he has quite a lot of books but I don't think I've read any of them. Look at the back. Yeah, he's got next, Kings of Infinite Space, The Lecturer's Tale, Publish and Perish, The Wild Colonial Boy, and he lives in Austin, Texas. I love how that's like the last line. It's like, (laughs) here's all the books he wrote, and he lives in Austin, Texas. Like, thank you. Nice. (laughs) So he has written a lot. This is just the first time that I've ever come into contact with him. Are his other books classical based? I don't or... think so. They're not sounding very. No, <laughs> no. They, I mean, they probably deal. Seeing this one, they probably deal with like big topics as well. Yeah. And like, did you see his author's note of like all the text that he used in order to write this book? Oh no, I didn't see that. Oh my god, you guys! Like this man did his research. Like he read everything. I feel like you really can tell though, like with the writing style, you can really tell that he knows what he's talking about, or at least he's like making it up very well. Like, I feel like, yeah, you can really tell that he did his research. I didn't see that, but I could tell that he was like well-versed in the classics. And I think also what he did that was really good is setting it in a place that like no one really knows. Like when you're giving this to a wider audience, Like when Elodie Harper did Pompeii, for example, people know Pompeii. So there are people who've walked around or who have visited or who can Google the photos and like know what it looks like. And everyone knows at least what happened there. Whereas he's chosen a similar setting regarding a brothel, but in a totally different place that it's kind of like for, for the, at least I thought anyways, if you guys have read this and think completely opposite, then let me know. But like, I would imagine it's probably a good thing to do for a general audience. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think especially like the time as well, like a lot of, um, I feel like a lot of authors, at least that I've read, have a lot of focus on the pagan gods and like the golden age of Rome and all of this, that and the other. And so I felt like the fact that this was at the like sort of declining end, it set in a very like rogue place. Because I feel like a lot of people, when you think of the Roman Empire, you either think of like Rome, Italy, or if you're like a British audience, you think of Roman Britain. So I feel like I had to look up where the place was and I was like, oh, that's actually really cool. Like, I feel like it was really well done. And I also thought that again, with like the boy's introduction to the world, because it wasn't a place that I was familiar with like Pompeii, I felt like I really was experiencing it through him rather than placing my pre-existing knowledge completely into this world. Yeah, see, so that's interesting because I went to go visit a couple of sites in the south of Spain. So I kind of knew sort of what I was looking at because even then they mentioned a couple of them at the end and I was like, I've been to all those places. (laughs) I know the exact coast that we're talking about. So like I didn't have that necessarily like experience. I mean, of this specific town, I haven't been to anywhere around there. But like I went to, so they mentioned at the end, which is now modern day Tarragona, but it's Taraco in the book. So like I've been there and a couple of other places they were like, all these people are coming from. So I was like, okay, I know the weather. I know sort of like what this architecture was going to look like. But like you said, like discovering it for the first time, like I think that's a really safe option. and Like a good, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean like a good safe option. Like let's do it here because only a small portion of people will know what that looks like to fact check me. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think I'd be very interested to see why he did place it there, especially since he's from Texas. Maybe, maybe. Because what, this came out last year? This year, this year. I think it came out this year, yeah. It must be this year if it's in hardback. What is she saying last year for? But so I think it was this year. And obviously the Wolf Den has been out for like an age. So maybe it was like he had that idea and was like, shit, the Wolf Den's in Pompeii. We have to move. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. also I thought was interesting about this character is that he doesn't know where he's from. And that's really different to the Wolf Den. Because in the Wolf Den, we get everybody's background and how they ended up in 
slavery and in the brothel in Pompeii, whereas in this one, like, I mean, people are literally guessing where he's from. They're like, yeah, you're Syrian or like, yeah, you're North African or like, yeah, you're this. And he's like, okay. Yeah, no, I think one of the things I did find very interesting was that like number of times he was like breaking the fourth wall and talking to the reader. And I think half of it I found really interesting. Like the fact that he uh, like says, I don't know where I'm from. This isn't one of those stories where we're going to find out. Like, I just never knew where I came from and I never will know. But like, here's the story. So I felt like I did actually really like that because it probably would have been quite realistic for a lot of people that like they don't know where they've come from. And although it's very interesting to create these like fictional backstories for them, and I think it was done really well in Wolf Den, but I think this was equally as powerful because I was like, oh, like we're actually never going to find out. And now you're connecting to him even more because like you don't know where he's come from. He doesn't know where he's come from. Absolutely. And I think as well, like, I don't want to say identity crisis because he doesn't have one of those, but like I had one for him, if that makes yeah. sense, you know, <laughs> that it's like, he doesn't know any of those things. And because he never knew those things, he's like, okay, well, this is just my life. Like, I don't know my name and I don't know where I'm from. But as I was reading, I was like, doesn't that bother you? But then you kind of realize he has so many other things to worry about, that that probably would have been, like you said, like realistic in that time. Like yeah. he's worried about getting beaten. Like he literally has bigger fish to fry than like, what's my name and where was I born? Yeah. And when, I think it's interesting, like when he is younger, he's asking, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Uterp, Uterpy? Oh, I said Uterpy. Okay, Uterpy. I feel like a lot of the conversations that they have, um, like he is really questioning these things and he's like, but why do I not know? Like, I want to know. And then she's just like, look, like you're not going to, but just like, let's focus on now. And I feel like, he had that sort of like childish curiosity, but it essentially like did get beaten out of him, which was, yeah. Horrible, horrible like, really stuff. Horrible. <laughs> so speaking of Euterpe, I'm really curious to hear what you thought about her relationship with Ficaria, the chef. Well, I said Ficaria. Maybe that's not yeah. even how her name, but the chef. Yeah. I really don't know. I found it very strange. Like when it was happening... I really did not know what to think. I was like, is this like actually happening? Like what? And they never really explain it. It's just something that is going on, which again, I like because the boy wouldn't necessarily know what's going on. He's just seeing it. But at the same time, I was just like, but why, when did this happen? And what is this relationship? And I think, especially at the very end, I was confused about the ending. And then I was like, well, like I just... I don't know I don't want to spoil anything but I just thought the ending did really confuse me and I liked how it ended but I just had so many questions coming away from it that their relationship together was just like so complicated okay I want to spoil it so I'm going to give everybody like a few (laughs) seconds to dip out if you guys haven't read the book if you have you can stay but everybody else leave so that I can spoil the end we'll just have like a moment of silence let people exit okay, you should be gone now. And if not, not sorry. So this is why I had very mixed feelings about the relationship. Because when we got to the end and we have like that big fire happen and Fakaria kills Melpomene, I was a bit like, well, she finishes off the job basically of Melpomene. It felt like in hindsight, the whole relationship between Fakaria and Euterpe was just used in order to justify her actions at the end, rather than because that was a relationship that the author actually wanted to explore and that's a hot like topic to say yeah. but that's how it felt no I agree with you and I just think Fakaria, like all the way through her relationship with like Sparrow the boy that really confused me as well because she went from like literally hating him to like loving him again and like being his like mother figure to then hating him again but then I was like was that just like a ploy for this other thing to end And at the end, she was like, do you forgive me? I was just so confused. I was like, I just, I'm getting whiplash. I don't know what's going on. I felt the same way. I felt like her character really flip-flopped for me. And if if she hated him the whole time, then again, maybe she was just very good at covering it up because I went through a period where I was like, oh, so they've moved on. Like, Yeah, I was like, okay. How great. He's grown up. He's now pulling his weight as like, you know, a brothel worker now, shall we say. And so she's pretty happy. She's like, cool. Okay, he's out of my kitchen. 
great, no boy down here. And then all of a sudden, like you said, it's just rage, like sees red, wants to sell him. I was like, where did that come from? Yeah, like it just, it would just all happen so fast. And I just think, yeah, again, that's what really confused me at the end. I'm like, was was this like true rage? Or was it part of a bigger ploy? Or did this just sort of happen? And there was no sort of idea that it was gonna happen, like. And I feel like using, again, I've, I've, and I feel really bad saying this, but I do feel like the Euterpe Fakaria relationship was just used so that you're like, oh, that's why she's mad. Because yeah. also the question that I had, and maybe again, people who stuck around think differently and have their own opinions, let me know in the comments below. But I'm thinking this poor woman, Euterpe, is obviously a sex slave, right? That's her job. And she, we hear at least in the book at one point that they're literally having like eight customers a night per brothel worker. Yeah. And then after that, Vicaria would come upstairs and then because they're in love, then they would hook up. And I was just a bit like, I don't know if this woman that's just had very forced like relationships with stranger men or maybe regular men is then going to go, oh yeah, but it's okay because I love you. She's probably exhausted and tired and sore. Yeah. And that was just, and this is going to sound so bad. It screamed that a man wrote that. No, I think I do agree with you. And I feel like I don't understand the rage that like Kara was feeling by the fact that this poor boy who's going through all of this awful stuff at such a young age wants to seek just some like platonic company just wants to be near someone to get over this trauma and she's like oh like I hate you for this like you're taking taking this person away from me and I'm like it's just not it's just not your like place especially because she is a cook and she's not experiencing the same thing that these brothel workers are experiencing like night after night and I'm just like why do you have so much like bitter rage like surely if you love this woman you want to be there for her as opposed to like I don't know just using her as well it seems that's exactly how it came across it literally just came across that Fakara has so much rage and that she's latched herself onto one person that she thinks like oh I can relate to so it has to be Euterpe and then it it came like you said it came across as very like I'm also then going to use this person in the same way that she's being used but I'm going to tell her that I love her and I'm just like again I think this person would probably just want to like lay in bed by themselves and not talk to anybody after the yeah. end of the night. <laughs> like, no, like this exactly. is not easy. And you've just been cooking in the kitchen and then all the rage that you have gets taken out on a 10 year old. Yeah. And I just didn't understand like all of that rage. I just think at the end of the day, whether you like kids or not, or like this person or not, like they're all in the same boat and they're all supportive of each other. Even if it's like not, completely explicit like Mello Panini or whatever her name is <laughs> Panini <laughs> what's her name <laughs> Mel Pomini Mel goodness me I just called her a Panini <laughs> oh. <laughs> well let's talk about her character development now that we're well, here <laughs> I feel like I didn't like her as a character but I think you're not supposed to like her so I feel like she was well written in that sense because you understand why she's not liked and why she has this like self-righteous like belief in herself but again why is everyone taking it out on this like kid I really didn't like her relationship with him especially that horrible like second scene in the middle I was just like why is this happening and again he's like 10 or 9 in that scene which makes it even worse. And she's like a freed woman now. And I don't know how old she is, but apparently she's significantly older than the other women. And so it's just like, what what is going on? Like, this should not be normal. Even in this like ancient world, surely this is not okay. See, that's the question that I had. And I don't know enough about this kind of work in the ancient world to like have a real leg to stand on, but it really felt like this shouldn't be happening. And I think it's because as well, like, I don't know about you, but when it comes to the ancient one, you look at like young women who are then like forced to marry off older men. That's something where it's like, okay, at least in my modern brain, I can make that connection because one, I'm used to seeing it. So it happens all the time. And two, because they actually weren't fussed about women. They were just fussed about giving birth and it's safer to do it at that age. So I'm like, as horrible as it is, you do justify it in your head is like, this made sense to them. Otherwise you literally can't read it without cringing. 
Yeah. And like, you have to be able to do those things. But with this young boy, I couldn't come up with like, oh, this makes sense in the ancient world that this would be happening to a young nine-year-old. And so it just made me want to like run away from especially that scene between her and him. I was like, I don't get, I don't understand it. And I can't find that understanding in there. And I was like, huh, nope, putting it down. Yeah. And I understand like broaching difficult subjects and this possibly like very well could have happened and it doesn't make it like pleasant, but like it does happen. But I just think the way that they, the guy went about it again, I was just like, like why? <laughs> Like, why do we have to see this horrible scene? Especially if, like you said, like, I just can't get any sense of why that's okay. So I'm just like, why are you thinking about this? Like, how are you expecting readers to receive it? Right. I think you said that way better than me. That it's like, how do you think that a reader of the modern day is going to internalize that to even, again, horrible things happen. They're important to highlight. But it's like, you have to give me a sense of, there's really fucked up logic here. And at least yeah. I'm following it, even though I hugely disagree with it and don't think this should even be on the page, should have never happened, but it's like, I can see it sort of a thing. And I just, I, I literally am just cringing thinking of that scene. Both of those scenes back to back make me cringe, but Mel Pomini's role in that, I was like, oh. Yeah, I, I just think, especially it I think it was like the second half after all of these scenes it's just when I was questioning a bit like what was going on especially because the first half was so solid I feel like her character as she then changes to have like this position of power I just I just didn't quite understand it and I don't know I feel like it's difficult because I understand why she made the choices that she did like after the death and everything like that but I also just think I don't know that scene it just fucks me up <laughs> like as I think it should <laughs> like it was just so not okay that it just like again threw off any like sort of comprehension of the rest of the book I was just like wait like why did that happen I just well with her character when it comes to the business decisions that she made the one I didn't get was when she was like okay we need to bring in more money so instead of like eight customers per night everybody needs to be having like 14 and I was like, like that's a, that's a big ask. Don't agree with that. But when she's adding in things like the tip job or the tip box, whatever it was, where she's like, that's for all of you, or we're going to have private parties. Like, I do think that somewhere in there as a character, obviously it's weird to talk about her like she's a real person, but like, it seemed like there was somebody that did care for them and was like, I'm actually trying to get you guys the most money so that we can all get out of here together but it was a lot of those decisions that I was also equally at the same time going, but this is not making anybody's life better. Like this is actually making it way worse. Yeah, see, I feel like I partly disagree with you because I think she gave this like um, idea that she did really care for them. But at the end of the day, she just wanted to keep her position of power from that point on. And she was like, oh, well, I worked really hard, which is why I'm here. So if you work hard and do what I say, I will make you work hard and then you could possibly like free yourself or whatever but it's when she has this position of power and the other women are like okay you can help us now and she's like no I worked hard for this so you better work too and I just felt I didn't see her like care for them as it got later on which I feel like sort of leads towards why I don't want to make any spoilers really, but like- No, we're to, in the spoilers it, section. People have left. <laughs> led to like why she was basically killed at the end. It was just like, there was no like relationship there anymore. I feel like once she sort of left the brothel and took over, I feel like then it sort of severed, severed any sort of like connection that they had to care for each other. Cause it's not, oh, we're all in the same boat as like as each other but like, we don't really like each other, but we're all here, so like, let's get along. It felt very like, again, severed. And I was like, I don't know, man. See, I think that though, like I agree with everything that you said, but I think that at least what I read in her character, I think she went about it the wrong way, but I think that literally she was just like, cause the first thing she says to them is like, you know, I'm freed, you're all gonna save up enough money and you're also gonna be freed. She doesn't say yeah. necessarily like, we're all leaving the brothel, but she's like, at least that way you get to do whatever you want to, we're then all freed and we have a different legal status. 
And I think she went about it completely incorrectly when it came to, as we mentioned, like upping the amount of men that they have to sleep with and the private parties and like the kids that are coming in for these private yeah. parties. Like, I don't think she went about it in the wrong, in the wrong, in the right way. Of course she went about it the wrong way. But I did see that she was trying and she was just like, let's try something new. Let's try something different. Let's try something that the previous owner, well, not owner, but like manager wouldn't have done. Like moving Fakaria into the kitchen was clearly a great decision. Like we saw a huge difference in that character when she's downstairs. The banter that she has with the punters and all of that, like great decision. But yeah, I think that Mel Pomeney's decisions at the end of the day were not the right ones, but I think the intention was there. Yeah, I mean, I do actually kind of get that because she obviously makes the like little like cubicles or rooms um, that the workers are working in. She makes them nicer for them and she's just like, oh, like convincing, I can't remember what his name is, the head honcho man. Um, <laughs> convincing <laughs> him like, I can't think of what it oh, is. God. It's like, I just, he just it's called Dominus all the time. Yeah, yeah, let's just go with that. <laughs> um, but she was convincing him like, oh, if they're in like a nicer space or they have nicer things, then like, you know, you'll get more money. So I, I can see it there. She didn't, she, like she did sort of, want the best out of a bad situation I just yeah I agree I think she went about it very the wrong way and became a bit like inflated with herself whilst doing it absolutely and I think that that see that for me was understandable with that character though because I'm like she's had nothing her whole life worked her way up to freed person still was working underneath this manager then the manager dies so she's like that's my time to shine and to finally get something that I feel like I deserve and it's one of those moments where she just like got to it, latched onto it, made all the wrong decisions, but wasn't willing to at any point say that she had made the wrong decisions. And so yeah. pushed people out. And I think that, I think like it was written very well because I didn't like her as a character, but it wasn't because she was badly written. I just didn't agree with the decision she was making. And I was like, I can see why, she, like you said, I can see why she's doing it and I can see X, Y, and Z, um, but I'm just not agreeing with it. And I think that makes a good character because she's dislikable in a well done way. I couldn't agree with that more. And I think that shows how good the author is at what he does. Because again, like like you said, like these characters were not terribly written. Otherwise we wouldn't have so much to say about them. Like they're clearly complex characters aside from Fakaria where I have multiple questions. Maybe I should just bring him on for an interview and be like, just one character. That's what we do. Like (laughs) just, just tell me what's going on. Because especially like when she, so let's talk about the ending because that was like zero to a hundred very quickly. Yeah. Because we have whatever we're calling the boy, mouse, whatever it is, he comes in. Then you've got Malpomene and Fakaria get into an argument and then he stabs her in the back with a knife. That to me was a surprise. Was that a surprise to you? It definitely was. And I think I had to go back and reread it slightly because I was just like, wait, like, who did he just stab? Like, why did he do that? Because I was like, surely he hasn't just done that. And even he was in a bit of shock. But I was just like, this, especially like with his sort of understandable fear and trauma of violence and everything leading up to this. There was, I think, one scene where like a man was like stabbed outside the kitchen. And I remember that so vividly because I was like, it's so well written and he was really upset about it and like really scared of men, etc. And it seems like he just sort of turned into everything that he was scared of in that split second. Cause I was like, why have you just done that? Like it didn't make any sense. 100%. And also I think what's really important is that he didn't have any men around him that really modeled that either. Like you said, there was that scene outside the kitchen door. So he hears it and he's like really distraught by it. But like, he's not around, like, you know, he doesn't grow up in like a military barracks. Like he's growing up with these women and Euterpe's doing such a good job of shielding him from so much. So he's, it's not like he's around seeing people stab other people all the time. Like that's not, he saw the punters fight, but he's not around real violence. So The fact that he acted in such a violent way, I was like, where did that, where did that come from? No, I agree. And the fact that like, I think it says a few times that he doesn't associate himself with these men because he's, he doesn't understand why they're doing this. He is very aligned with the women and their beliefs and like their actions. So again, I was just like, where has this come from? And then I feel like everything from that point onwards was just like, bam, bam, bam. And I think, I mean, I read it a few weeks ago now, 
but I, I was just so confused I was like what is going on I couldn't work out how much of it was like planned how much of it was accidental like why all of this was happening why they even saved him like that boggled my brain because it was so quick to get rid of Euterpe because oh god in case people are now like what are you talking about if we all remember because you you guys have all read the book that's hopefully no one's <laughs> watching this for just spoilers but like they tried to escape Euterpe and the boy and then that whole shebang they get into the car and then they're just driven right back to the Dominus's house I was like what I was so upset by that. I was just like, I feel like that just, like, why did any of, again, why did this happen? I just feel like I get the fact that, like, she was obviously betrayed and all of this, but I just felt from the, like, bath work, why did he feel the need to do that? Especially since, like, they've obviously not been, like, supportive, but they've had this relationship of going to the baths, like, however many times. I was like, why has he just switched and, like, decided to betray her and just take her straight back? And I didn't get as well, like Euterpe at the start of the book is like, we'll run away, run away. The whole middle chunk, she's like, no, we're not running away. And I thought that it was like, okay, well, that makes sense because she's telling the young boys that he feels like he has an out, like giving him that bit of hope. He never asked for it. And I was like, as horrible as that was, like I agreed with her decision to do that for such a young child in that situation because then she takes it away from him and she explains to him, you know, like if we leave and we run, we'll starve or like this, that, like when he's old enough to get it. So that made sense to me. But then for her to flip back and to be like, no, now we're running. That didn't make any sense to me. No, I agree. And I think it it was done very well in the fact that she changed her mind and we could all see why she changed her mind and like all of this stuff. But even when they were trying to escape and she was just like, okay, if anyone asks, like you're nothing to do with this. Like it's all like, like, why, why are you doing this? And that's why I was so confused. Cause I was like, in my head, I was like, was this planned to then make a bigger escape or was it not? Or like, am I reading into it too much? Like, I just couldn't quite place that episode in amongst everything that happened at the end. Well, that's interesting because they did mention the fire when Aldo died, that they were like, oh, we'll just set the brothel on fire. And they were like, well, we can't yeah. fucking do that. Don't be stupid. We'll just put them upstairs. So obviously when the fire happened at the end, I'm like, funny, they've all thought about this for a very long period of time. But now that you've said that, because she was, like, Euterbi was putting in so many buffers. Like, yeah, we're going to try and escape. But if they catch us, blah, 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 like, just so that you know, or if this happens, this, that, and the other. So, like, all of that was discussed. Like, he's supposed to get out and go back. I didn't think about it, but maybe that was all part of the the plan to begin with. That it's like, Euterbi has to go and do this in order to get Fakaria to be mad enough or, like, to set everything on fire like I don't know but that's a that's a possibility yeah I just think yeah again that whole final episode was so confusing that I'm like I just couldn't understand if it was a plot or not and whether or not he meant it to be like you're supposed to be questioning it and I just like especially with the fire I just don't understand why they went up and saved him I just think at the end of the day, if it's all burning down, why are you searching for this 10 year old boy? Especially considering at the end, like they sold everyone anyway. I feel like obviously it is a lot of money for these people, but I just didn't like, how did they, I don't know. That's a very good point. Like why would they go all the way upstairs to get a slave when literally in the ancient world, that he's nothing. Yeah. Like he literally means nothing to anyone. And like, he has said that himself so many times he's just like I'm just like something to be used and abused in this like scenario so why again were they seeking him out like Mm. I don't know I'm thinking about this (laughs) it did just confuse me because I just thought and especially the fact that they did save him I was just like at the end of the day like they like no one knew at this point like why everything was set on fire like what was going on so why did they run up and then save him and then like I don't know I'm just kind of struggling to remember what actually happened now because I was just like what like what was going on I mean that's literally what happened is that (laughs) Vicaria gets mad because Euterpia Solby still don't really know why and then she what you no Malpomene gets stabbed in the back by the boy and then gets finished off by Vicaria by slicing her neck but then Fakaria just like knocks him out upstairs. And I'm just like, but why have you done that? Like, did you want him to be saved? 
or like was this like all part of your like other ploy <sighs> do we think do we know if there's a book too i don't know i haven't seen or heard anything just because like i even felt like where the book ended like we know that he ends up in roman britain because he says that he's like now i'm in britain and it's always raining here um and he's like writing from some library but where the book ends is him on a boat and it's yeah. sort of like that nice little image of like Utapi shows up and unlatches the the I was gonna say chain. That's not like cage. There we go. <laughs> like unlatches that and they have like a cute little walk into the distance sort of a thing with all the other wolves, whatever. But I was like, okay, well, that's great how we got out of the brothel. But you opened the story by telling me that he's in Britain. Yeah. So I'm like, it's not like like it would be different for us. Like this is the story of me in the brothel, and here's the story, and that's it. But there were so many references to Roman Britain, and like the fact that he's there and he's living a better life, and how he's looking back on all of this, and like you know, there were just so many little tidbits from his life now that I was like, well, how did we get from this horrible situation to this uplifting one? Yeah, and I feel like he did mention a few times that like the women were with him at like some points in Britain, and like now he was just sort of like the last person and I'm like I don't know I feel like I agree there was a lot that could happen and especially at the end there was just so much like instant forgiveness from everything that just like went down in that very short amount of time Uter- Uterpi and Fakari like just were instantly forgiven not no like qualms or anything and then the boy is just like yeah like it's fine I forgive you even though you've been a bastard to me for my entire life like I just thought it was so like I felt like it was tied up a bit too neatly considering it wasn't t- really tied up right and I think I think had there not been so many references to his current life I yeah. wouldn't have had so many issues with that but yeah. I think it's because I was like well there's a huge chunk of time where we know some things happen some things don't happen people get lost people stay but we've ended it on this boat when he's like 10 years old. Yeah. And now it's much later. So we tied up all of that seemingly with a nice little bow on it, despite there being so many questions. But again, to me, I was like, that's just a huge jump. Why would you, and I think this is the question. Why would you mention so many details about Roman Britain if we weren't going to get there? Yeah. And I, is it just to like show off your knowledge of ancient Britain or like, are you planning on writing another one? Because I can see very clearly how like another book could fit in. Exactly. But yeah, no, I agree. Like why put in so many details that are then just going to be ignored? Exactly though. Like it, I can see if it's like a duology of like, here's the first part of the story. And then here's how I got to Britain. Here's how I became this person. Like that makes total sense. So if there is a second book, guys, just disregard all of this. Like... <laughs> if that happens but at the point of recording we have no idea so it seems very strange as like a standalone book to do that I feel like again the first bit love middle bit horrified ending just confused and so (laughs) (laughs) to sum up Macy's thoughts about Sparrow (laughs) but I just think like the characters so were so well done that at the end I was so confused because I'm just like for the entire time I can see the like clear rational and like all of this stuff behind their thoughts feelings actions and then suddenly I'm like why has this happened like I thought I knew these characters but I clearly don't if I'm not understanding anymore that's a really good point it's like with all the questions even though because I agree with you that it's like you really trust these people like I know exactly how they're going to act by the end of it and then it's like oh nope I know nothing so maybe I didn't know any of them to begin with like maybe I fooled myself into yeah. knowing all of these people <laughs> no I agree and I think even if they had acted very differently but we knew why then I would have been like oh I thought I knew them but they're now this but it was like I thought I knew them and now like I don't know it like at all like there were no answers to the questions I had and not that all of them did have to be answered I think like ending on like a bit of a cliffhanger is very interesting but I just think there were slightly too many questions in that end sequence that just left me feeling not disappointed, but just a bit like, oh, it stopped. As opposed to like, we've now finished. Absolutely. Okay, so considering we've been talking for 50 minutes, will I cut things out? Who knows? (laughs) 
50 minutes. So just as like a closing thought for people who have gotten this far, I presume they've already like read this book and have their own thoughts and feelings just because we left everybody else like halfway through this chat. (laughs) So for those people, if they're thinking, oh gosh, do I recommend this book? And if I do, who's like the ideal audience for it? Like for that person, like how do you think they should pitch this if they want to recommend it? I'm actually really not sure because I've been talking to a few of my friends about having read it. And after me like saying a very small amount, they were like, oh, I don't think I want to read that. Because I think the like trigger warnings, I think would put off a lot of people, which is possibly why they're not anywhere. Because I know I would have second guessed reading the book if I'd known quite how graphic it was going to be. So I feel like I can't, I can't think of who the target audience is. I think the initial bit, everyone like it's a really good insight into like the fourth century roman world but the second half i really don't know where i would place it like i can't think of anyone that i would recommend it to being like this was a really good book because it was good but i would just think twice about recommending some of the content i completely agree like absolutely i couldn't have said it better myself so We should probably wrap it up now anyways. So thank you, Macy, so much for joining me today. It means the absolute world that you took time out of your Sunday to sit and chit chat with me about this book, that you took time out of your incredibly busy master schedule to read this book. Like genuinely, I'm so thankful for you to do this and to finally come on the channel and chit chat with me. And thank you guys for watching this video. Again, as I said at the start of it, you guys can obviously find all of the links in the description to Macy's socials if you guys are more intrigued to see what other books that she's reading. Uh, Keep on top of all of that sort of stuff. Find her down in the description below as well as the link to the book. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.